Hi, I'm Ryan Krug, and I'm going to talk about uh, paleo and archaic projectile pointing distributions in the northern uh, in Coconino National Forest. Um, this whole process started because in the Forest Service, there were 35 years of projectile points. Uh, and when I say projectile points, I'm not just talking about arrowheads, okay? There's spears, there are atlatl darts, uh, arrowhead points, burns, uh, scrapers, knives, bifaces, drills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are in the collection. Uh, my task was, oh, by the way, the important thing about this entire study is that every item that we have has a provenience on it. That is, we have a UPS uh, number, uh, both east and, and north number, for each uh, item in the uh, study. The first thing I had to do was learn about the different projectile point types, the uh, different materials from which they were manufactured, and that's thanks to Paul Lindbergh a lot for his help with that. And then we, the task was to propose a standardized typology for projectile points. Uh, the most uh, important thing for you to know, one of the most important things for you to know, is that the, the, the data has some constraints. The first is that um, they show where points have been found, which reflects where people who have uh, found them turned them in. Uh, and of course, then, uh, confiscated collections are not in this, this particular database. 95% um, are surface grabs, um, and that means that there's been redisposition of points. And then there is only one excavation, and that's our, what the uh, chapter did at Honanki. The project itself, uh, what we did was put each lithic item on a spreadsheet with the type. There were metric measurements made on each one of them, and I'm not going to go through all of these because of the time variable. Um, the important thing is that all these data are in the database. They are accessible to persons who are interested in research on them. There are non-metric features also, and this has to do, was the point complete or was it not? Uh, what ma materials it was made from? Uh, if there was a break, uh, what was the type of break? Was it reworked? Was there wear grinding, uh, uh, heat treated or not? Stem type, uh, whether it was straight, contracting or flared, general shape, was it lancelet, triangular, leaf shape, et cetera, <clears throat> and a confidence rating on the type. The location information was put into the database uh, along with the UTMs, uh, the topo map where it was located, then the project name, for instance, Jerry Studies, uh, the CNF site number, and the isolated artifact number if it was from another kind of collection. Okay. Uh, the problem. The big problem we have with the whole business of projectile points is what do you call it? Um, what happens is that never in the history of the artifacts collection of projectile points and analysis has there ever been anything like what has been done with ceramics. Nobody has ever said this is what we call this point and everybody then says we call this point this. Rather, what happens is points are named for where they came from. For instance, Clovis was found, the first one in America, was found in Clovis, New Mexico. However, they're found all over the country and they're found all over the world, but they're still called in America a Clovis point. Uh, Pinto points uh, came from the Pinto Basin in uh, Southern California. A friend of mine gave me his collections that his mother had collected in Florida and the east coast of the United States, there are pinto points in that, those collections. So the issue is, uh, what do you call them? Uh, Texas has its own classification system. They have an entire book, and consequently, the names there are very different. Sometimes they're named for a, a time period, like uh, Western Basket Maker, two points. And then the problem is, <clears throat> with all of that data, the same morphologic type may be called by a whole bunch of different names. A desert side notch to us is a Cahokia in Illinois. It's a Buck Taylor in certain parts of uh, Arizona. It's a Toya in Texas, and they are all the same point. They all look alike. So the question is, what do you call it? And each time you find a new article where there is a credible reference, uh, and you say, OK, that's wrong. We have to do it again. We have to redo the entire collection, and that has led to some problems. Um, the question is, who's the authority? 
God, I just won't even go into that. <laughs> what has happened for us, what's happened for us <clears throat> is that we had the uh, advantage of both the Kaibab with Mike Linden, many of you know him and have seen his work. Uh, our uh, project started at the same time we got together and we said we're going to call them the same thing. So we have about 90 to 95% agreement on what we call our categories. Uh, then Kathy Camp, Peter, and John Whitaker, because we were having trouble with the small point collection, they got together and made an entirely new classification which we've been working on. As a result, we have a total of 79 different point types and what is happening right now is I am creating a field manual. We are about two to three weeks away from that field manual and hopefully we will be able to get it published so you can stick it in your back pocket, take it out and say, okay. Um, major goal to create this typology, if we can, then we can get all, perhaps, all the Forest Service, all the contract archeologists and academics working in the forest, we can get them together to uh, use the same typology. It will then go into uh, a com comparable data file which covers about 8.7 million acres. Uh, it would be, be become one, if not the largest, projectile point database in the United States. Okay, what we have here, this is our categorization. Paleo, early paleo, late paleo, early archaics, middle archaics, late archaics, and then there are also the ceramic period points. I'm only going to show you one set of data from the ceramic period time, and that is the desert side notch, because there's a special kind of issue there. The analysis of the data. The important thing is that without computers, we can't do it. What we did was um, Chris Barrett, who was a computer person with the Forest Service, he loaded our spreadsheet into the computer with a GIS type program called Terago. It was loaded in the computer, the two systems were merged, and now we have a map for each point, each point type. So that we have a map for Clovis, we have a map for Scotts Bluffs and so forth. This is all the points in the collection, okay? Um, there are more points than what it appears on this particular uh, slide. The, because they are so heavily concentrated in certain areas of the country, uh, of the Forest Service. Just to give you a reference, uh, this is Sycamore Canyon up here, this is Sedona here, and this area here is Chavez Pass Range. These are the Clovis Point distributions. This is I-17 coming up here, this is I-40 coming across here, this is Mormon Lake here, and this is uh, Highway 87 here. The, these are the two points that are from the Verde Valley area, uh, these two also. What you see is that the Clovis points tend to be in this particular area, which is the Ponderosa Pine Zone area. There is one point up here, and then there is also a couple of points that did not get picked up by the program, which are around Flagstaff, Lupaki, so forth. The next slide is from the late Paleo period, and these are the Scotts Bluff points. These also tend to be congregated here in the central area, more in the Verde Valley, as it was true of the Clovis points. There are a few of them scattered in, uh, around the, the country more than there was with the Clovis. And now we go to the early archaic. Early archaic points, um, I have pictures of them to the sides here. And this is a time period, 7,000 to 4,250 BC. And again, what you see is that here, we have the Verde Valley, a large collection of uh, uh, points in there, Flagstaff here. Uh, down here is East Clear Creek, a uh, number of sites down in here. And then, as we keep going, middle archaic period, same distribution, uh, that is the similar 
uh, uh, distribution here. Most, more, a majority occurring in the uh, Verde Valley uh, along uh, Highway 260 here, 87 here, and up around the Flagstaff Winslow area here. So as you can see, as the time is going on, uh, if the number of points projects or estimates the population uh, of the area, you see a denser, more and more dense population distribution. And this continues as we go on through the, the remainder of the slides. This is the late archaic period, uh, 2650 BC to AD 300. And as you see here, much, much more dense uh, distribution, but the distribution doesn't seem to change. Again, it's very dense in this area here. And if you take, if you can see behind the dots, the little blue lines, these are all water sources. And one of the things that seems to be pretty clear is that you uh, see the um, collect, or concentration of points where there is water sources available, <clears throat> et cetera. Now, there's another uh, piece of data that is important uh, for us to take a look at. We took a look yesterday at the desert side notch points and to see if, in fact, we had some distributions that made any sense. And what you see here, this, look at the date. This is A.D. 1300 to uh, 1600 A.D. And what you are, can see over here in the Anderson Mesa area, these are Yavapai Apache points. Uh, these are points that occur mostly with the Yavapai Apache. And uh, you can see that they have been uh, over in the Anderson Mesa area. And this hasn't been reported before. Uh, this is just new data that is coming out of the analyses that we're doing. One of the other things that we're doing with these data is to expand where uh, certain projectile points occur. Uh, the issue is you know, Jane Sleva down at the Center for Desert Archaeology in Tucson has published recently some articles on the location of particular points like Cienegas and Carteros. And she says that they don't occur above this area, uh, middle uh, central Arizona. Our, our data very clearly show that they do. Uh, it very clearly shows that they are above that area. Another, uh, looking at some of the conclusions from the data, Clovis point materials. Um, one of the things that's very interesting is that all of our Clovis points, we have 13 of them in the collection now, all of them are made from local material. There is some data that's been put forward that Clovis Point people, uh, in fact, traveled great distances to get their materials to make their points from. All of our points are from local material in the, the Coconino area. The next conclusion that we can really come to is that this whole area has been continuously inhabited since Paleo-Indian times. From Paleo-Indian to early, middle, late archaic, northern and southern Sanaba, Coconino, and down to proto-historic times. What's possible? The data is a gold mine. Um, we can begin to look at locations and trade routes of lithic materials. Anybody who's interested in multivariate statistical analysis, the data are in there. They can do that to uh, uh, classify morphologic types. We have never, we haven't even started looking at um, the knives, the burns, the scrapers, the drills, et cetera, to look at the distributions on those. If indeed points reflect population size, uh, we can begin to uh, look at the relationships there. And then, because of that important correlation with water, the issue is about climatic changes and the point style relative to the climatic changes. Where are we going from here? Um, we're working with other forest and archaeologic groups, hopefully to get that field manual in place, so they'll begin to use it too. I've only shown you the paleo and archaic points. We have the entire area of um, the more ceramic period points to go. So uh, it's a, a work in progress, and trust me, it will go past my lifetime. Thanks. <laughs>